Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We're going to keep walking through the Cerisquia, and we talked about Ceratosauria last time, the horned dinosaurs. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Megalosauroidea today, so the large or big lizards. Uh, and then we're going to keep on walking through the rest of the theropods. And then next week, we're going to talk about the sauropods. And then the whole next module is on the Ornithischians. Uh, before we do that, though, some announcements. Just make sure that you're keeping up with all the assignments and that you know what's up. And if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to me. Okay, so let's talk about what we talked about last time, the Ceratosauria. So the Ceratosauria are known mostly for their what? So here's some pictures of some uh, different dinosaurs. Uh, some of them are Ceratosaurs, some of them aren't. Which ones are which? Hmm. So what helps you distinguish? A ceratosaur. All right, so ceratosaurs are defined by their kind of blunt snouts and their uh, short, very reduced arms. Uh, they also often have uh, pretty elaborate skull ornamentation. Uh, so this looks like a, a Carnotaurus with the kind of bull horns, the meat eating bull with the dra drastically reduced forelimbs and the kind of blunt snout. So like T-Rex has a much more elongated snout, although they do uh, bear some superficial resemblances. Remember the arms are even further reduced than T-Rex arms. Uh, they're definitely not herbivorous. They're uh, with maybe a couple exceptions, carnivorous. Uh, they are not quadrupeds, they're fully bipedal. And a lot of them often have head ornamentation. So that's not it either. Okay, so let's look at uh, tectonics here. So. Uh, during the Mesozoic, what was happening to the continents? So we saw last time how plate tectonics and how the continent positions are going to end up impacting how these dinosaurs evolve and where they end up on Earth and which ecosystems they are part of. So what is happening during the Mesozoic to the continents? The little red pin here is us we go. So what's happening here? The continents are uh, drifting apart. So at the beginning of the Mesozoic, at the end of the Permian and into the Triassic, uh, Pangaea is assembled. And so where the continents come together, uh, we get these big old mountain ranges here from the continents smashing into each other. The interior of Pangaea is pretty dry, pretty arid, pretty inhospitable. Uh, the continents start breaking apart uh, first, the, the North Atlantic kind of opens up, separating America from Africa. Then the South Atlantic kind of starts opening up, separating Africa from South America. Uh, and then the continents just kind of keep drifting uh, until this is what they look like uh, when the dinosaurs go extinct. The Chicxulub of impact is right about here-ish. Uh, in fact, it looks like they've actually marked it with a crater there on the map. Um, and then from here, they drift into their present position in the 66 million years since the dinosaurs died. Uh, so the plates were coming together at the, at the very end of the Paleozoic, they were assembling into Pangaea. But the story for the Mesozoic is that they're drifting apart. Uh, continents never remain in place. They're always moving around. Uh, and uh, by the end of the Mesozoic, they resemble today enough that you can kind of make them out. Uh, but they're definitely not exactly like today. All right, so where are we? So uh, we're going to keep talking about the theropods. So uh, we talked about this branch last time. Uh, we're going to talk about this branch here today, and then we're going to move up to here next time, and then there's the last spend the next two lectures on here, the Solarosaurs and the, the Manoraptora. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Megalosauroidea, which includes the Megalosauridae and the Spinosauridae. So let's start off with the Megalosauridae. So uh, Megalosaur, Mega means great or big or large. I think I use all of them kind of interchangeably in here, but they're big lizards. Uh, defined by their elongated skull. Uh, they have these powerful forelimbs and uh, they have a uh, maxillary fossa instead of a hole. So um, we see in some of the larger carnivores where there's actually a hole in the front of the skull. Uh, here it's just a kind of little bit of a depression there. Uh, Megalosauridae are named after Megalosaurus which as you recall from a couple lectures before, was one of the original three dinosaur genre that were named by Richard Owen. 
going along with the uh, Iguana, Iguanodon and the Hyliosaur. Uh, so they're grouped together in the Tetanure, uh, which means stiff tails, which is basically all of the non ceratosaur theropods and also birds. So the dinosaurs that we talked about last time, the ceratosaurs, they're not uh, in this Megalosauridae, but um, or not in the Tetanore, but all the subsequent ones we're going to be talking about are. Um, and uh, so these uh, uh, Megalosauridae was uh, formerly uh, a quote unquote wastebasket taxon where it was a theropod dinosaur, it was a carnivorous dinosaur, but it clearly wasn't a ceratosaur, it clearly wasn't a carnosaur, it didn't belong in with the coelosaurs, it wasn't a manoraptorin. Uh, where did it belong? It was often just kind of chucked in here in the Megalosauridae. So it was kind of a messy definition of the group, but uh, with more modern taxonomy, a more modern approach, uh, it's become better defined. And so these are some of the things that we expect to see as that elongated skull, as you can see behind me, uh, the powerful forelimbs, which you can also see behind me. Uh, and again, remember, we can see this is the original interpretation of Megalosaurus. Again, like quadrupedal, bulky, slow lizard. And this is maybe a more modern representation here. Uh, bipedal, uh, not quite as prominent forelimbs here, but the, the center of gravity above the hips versus in the middle. Uh, you see the elongated snout here. Uh, you actually even see these little filamentous feathers here along the back. Uh, not a fully feathered body. Uh, there is no evidence of these filamentous feathers in Megalosaurus. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit of evidence in a few slides, but um, again, probably the larger dinosaurs didn't have feathers, and if they did, it probably wasn't a full body covering, but again, we may never know for sure because only the hard parts are preserved, and getting glimpses at preserved feathers or preserved skin covering, preserved uh, integumentary is, is pretty uh, sparse. Uh, so the first one we're going to talk about is uh, Marshasaurus. It, well, it translates to Marsh's lizard, uh, named after our good friend, Othniel Marl Charles Marsh uh, of the Bone Wars fame. Uh, so this is a kind of medium-ish sized theropod uh, from the Mor Morrison Formation. So uh, it's highlighted here. So again, this is dinosaurs of Morrison Formation. Uh, we saw this slide last time when we we're talking about the ceratosaur here, uh, kind of a little bit smaller than Allosaurus, uh, significantly smaller than Allosaurus, who was the primary dominant, uh, most diverse carnivore in the Morrison. Uh, Marshosaurus is also uh, quite a bit smaller than Allosaurus, uh, probably feeding on some of these smaller dinosaurs and probably smaller mammals and, and whatever it can kind of come across. Uh, here's a dog for scale here. So it's about as high as a human or so. Uh, again, still a pretty formidable animal. Uh, you definitely wouldn't want to run into it, uh, but it's definitely not uh, on the size and scope of an Allosaurus. Uh, look how much uh, thicker the build is here. Uh, and then these are also uh, probably just larger uh, specimens of Allosaur maybe, but they're different Allosauroids. Uh, Torvosaurus, another large carnivore we're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, this is one of the Megalosaurids as well. Again, you see that elongated nose. Uh, and the forelimbs are a little bit more functional than some of the uh, allosaurs. Um, again, you see kind of the elongated low skull uh, with the teeth really kind of more towards the front here. Uh, you see this boundary here between the premaxilla out front and the rest of the skull. And you see this kind of just indent here instead of an actual hole, which we'll see on some of the uh, larger carnivores. Uh, so that's Marshosaurus. Uh, one of the megalosauroids. Uh, and then there's uh, Pyatnitskisaurus, uh, is one of the more basal uh, tetanurans. So uh, it's, it's, it's more derived, it's more evolved uh, further along in evolution than the ceratosaurs, um, but it's kind of a, a basal member of these tetanurans, the megalosauroidea. Uh, it's known from the Middle Jurassic in Argentina. And again, unlike the ceratosaurs, the forelimbs are fully functional uh, and they're tipped with these kind of you know, pretty robust claws. Uh, superficially, it resembles 
Allosaurus. And again, as we talked about on the last slide, uh, Allosaurus was a very dominant carnivore in the Morrison Formation in the Jurassic uh, all around the world. Uh, this has a, a pretty strong resemblance to it, a little bit smaller though, uh, but probably filled a pretty similar role, uh, mostly in the areas where Allosaurus kind of wasn't around. So again, like there's this niche partitioning where uh, a given environment isn't going to be able to sustain a lot of different very large carnivores. So wherever a very dominant species like say Allosaurus is present, the others are either in really reduced numbers or they're kind of doing something different. They're hunting different prey or they're hunting in different locations, different environments. Uh, so moving along to uh, Scryuramimus, uh, the name translates to squirrel mimic. Uh, we'll see this Mimus uh, suffix quite a lot in some of the dinosaurs that we'll be talking about. Uh, Mimus means mimic, so it's like a clone. So uh, this is squirrel mimic. It's a dinosaur that looks like a squirrel, uh, named for its uh, filamentous plumage on its tail. So it's kind of this cute little dinosaur, uh, kind of resembles a lizard squirrel in some ways. Uh, it's known from only one specimen, uh, and it has been in previous times classified with the Solarosauria, which is, you know, that line that the, the birds end up being on, T-Rex is also on there, uh, which is kind of not all that newsworthy that it had feathers if it's on that branch. Uh, but if it is one of these megalosauroids, uh, then that is kind of newsworthy because it might be representing the most basal uh, feathered theropod. And so if this kind of very basal theropod had feathers, did all of the later more derived theropods have feathers? So it has implications for then all the other megalosaurids, all the carnosaurs, all the other theropods that we're going to talk about later in the class. If this thing had feathers and it is the base, base a basal member, uh, then one would expect that at least they have the capability of developing feathers uh, later on in the line. Uh, here's a very heavily prepared specimen here. You see they kind of removed a lot of the rock to kind of generate like the, the body outline here. Uh, and you see that it's a relatively small, small specimen. And uh, allegedly there's filaments of feathers preserved on tail here, although I don't see it in this particular picture. Um, so uh, another one, uh, Monolophosaurus, Monolophosaurus. <laughs> Just like Dilophosaurus meant two crested lizard, uh, Monolophosaurus means single crested lizard. So it's named for this kind of single crest uh, right down the middle of its snout. So it's from the middle Jurassic uh, Wu Kaiwen formation in, in China. Uh, and it was actually found during exploration related to the oil industry. So there were uh, industrial professor professionals doing field work out there trying to map out the rocks related to oil exploration, they kind of stumbled upon uh, this dinosaur specimen. Uh, and it was originally classified with Allosauroidea, but again, after closer inspection, uh, we see kind of this uh, more elongate skull, uh, kind of lower, uh, if you take, especially if you take away the crest. Uh, so this is again, classified in here with the Megalosauroidea. Uh, and then, uh, the one that gives the group its namesake is Megalosaurus itself. So we've seen this slide before, but uh, in 1824, uh, this jawbone here was described by the Reverend William Buckland, uh, but there was evidence of this thing even before here when Robert Plott described this uh, massive femur head here, uh, scrotum humanum because of the resemblance to, well, you know, um, originally they interpreted it as like a big old, uh, like a war elephant. It was recognized that it was a very large animal, the leg bone of a very large animal. Uh, and not until later was it recognized that it was a, a megalosaur femur. Uh, but again, the name means big lizard, thought to be kind of like a, a giant monitor lizard. And you can see again, the reconstructions here look like a giant lizard, the quadrupedal slow plotting reconstruction. Uh, by about the turn of the century, uh, there started being this like more bipedal interpretation, more active. Uh, it was realized that the pelvic structure and the center of mass of these dinosaurs 
uh, wasn't as far forward and that they were actually walking upright. And so we kind of moved to a little bit like this model. Uh, and now this is kind of the more modern model where the weight center of mass is still over the hips. This one still looks a little bit front heavy. There's probably a little bit more weight in the tail here to counterbalance it, but um, you know, not stiff, full upright, but kind of a more like down position, the head generally kind of like down and forward, the body kind of almost horizontal, uh, but center of mass above the hips and the forelimbs up off the ground and free, uh, which is important if you're megalosaurid because you have these really good fully functioning arms with these massive claws at the end uh, that can help you with hunting down your prey and capturing your prey. Uh, probably the uh, most intimidating of these uh, megalosaurids is Torvosaurus. So its name uh, translates to a savage lizard. It's one of the largest Jurassic carnivores in North America, and it's also found in Europe. Again, it's highlighted here. Uh, Allosaurus was again still the dominant carnivore. Again, you see the like much more robust build. Uh, this kind of lower, thinner, you see it's a little bit more slender, a little bit more elongate, maybe a little bit more delicate. Uh, this probably allowed it to kind of hunt in areas where Allosaurus couldn't. You see that Allosaurus itself and then some of the larger Allosaurids, uh, they're much more bulky. Uh, they're probably built for kind of like running in open space. Uh, they're not as good at kind of ducking around in between obstacles and kind of being more of like an ambush predator. Uh, so Torvosaurus and some of the smaller megalosaurids uh, and even some of the ceratosaurs probably filled this niche where uh, they were hunting in areas where the larger dinosaurs just couldn't or wouldn't go. Uh, uh, so they were competing alongside the large carnivores. Uh, again, Allosaurus was like 75% of Morrison formation theropods. So the Allosaur body plan was, was highly successful. Uh, but there was room in other niches and other parts of the environment for other larger carnivorous dinosaurs. Uh, they just weren't able to reach the kind of numbers and diversity of the others. But uh, uh, unlike the ceratosaurs that weren't capable of taking down some of these larger uh, herbivores, uh, these probably were, although maybe not the largest part of their diet, they probably were able to, again, there's some sauropod dinosaurs, the big uh, four-legged dinosaurs that aren't shown on this diagram. We'll talk about them uh, next week. Uh, and then the last megalosaurid that we're going to talk about, uh, Afrovenator, uh, it translates to uh, African hunter. So remember, Venator is hunter, those uh, gladiators that primarily fought with animals. Uh, it's named for its original location, Africa, the country of Niger, uh, and its predatory lifestyle, hunting. So Afrovenator. Uh, it's known from only one relatively complete fossil, and so this is a skeletal diagram here uh, from the literature, and you can see that uh, what they, what we call relatively complete, uh, it's still missing a lot of material. So this is pretty standard in paleontology. You don't find the whole animal, or I should say very rarely do you find the whole animal. So this is a reconstruction. Uh, that you might see in a museum. It's a mounted reconstruction uh, based on these bones. And so again, what they do is they take the bone material that they have and they look at the anatomy of other very close relatives, uh, other megalosaurids in this case, and try to kind of fill in the gaps of the stuff that's missing. And again, like the more material that's missing, the wider the error bars on here, the bigger the guesswork is involved, uh, the more likely that there's room to be wrong, in some cases dramatically wrong, uh, but you've got to do what you can. So we've got the scattered material. Uh, we are capable of reconstructing an entire animal from this material. It's just that there's going to be a little bit more interpretation involved, um, especially on like size and mass and things like that. Uh, but Afrovenator was probably like an actual like apex predator in its environment, and it was probably hunting these very large sauropods here, Jobaria, which we'll talk about, I think, when we talk about the sauropods. Uh, but again, you see this, these characteristics of the Megalosauria, the elongated skull, uh, the teeth towards the front here, the very uh, free hands with uh, functional 
four limbs uh, tipped by these pretty nasty claws here. So again, their forelimbs, uh, unlike the ceratosaurs that we talked about last time, the forelimbs are very functional. And unlike the ceratosauria that we talked about last time that had kind of that blunted, almost pug nose, uh, these have a very elongated, very long, very low skull uh, supporting all these uh, massive teeth. Uh, so that's the Megaloceroidea uh, onto the Spinosauroidea, or Spinosauridae, I should say. Uh, spino, uh, spinosaur is spine lizard. So spinosaurs are named for the ridge along their spine. So there's this big sail, or at least what's currently interpreted as a sail. You can see an example uh, back here. Uh, so that's what they're named after, Spinosaurus, for the spine on their back. Uh, this spine kind of becomes kind of more and more prominent uh, in spin spinosaurids over time. Uh, they also have a very elongated, narrow skull with conical teeth, uh, as opposed to kind of the more knife-like and serrated teeth that we see in most of the other carnivorous theropod dinosaurs. Uh, this probably indicates uh, piscivory or piscivory. So remember again, Pisces is the zodiac sign for fish. Uh, a piscivore is something that primarily eats fish or a good portion of its diet comes from eating fish. Uh, this is a very similar geometry that we see in like modern crocodiles and they subsist uh, a lot on fish. Uh, but you see, unlike crocodiles, uh, they also have these uh, highly functional, very clawed forelimbs, uh, so you're probably able to grasp as well. Uh, and they were also among the largest theropods here, but particularly uh, Spinosaurus aegypticus. Uh, the one we talked about, uh, the stamp specimen from found in Egypt, um, pro pro possibly the largest theropod ever. Um, so let's walk through a couple of these. So uh, Baryonyx, uh, Baryonyx is a sort of early Spinosaurid, and its uh, name translates to uh, heavy claw. So Bary means heavy, and Onyx is claw. Uh, so it's named for the very large claw on the first digit. So again, if you have your hand here, digit one, two, three, four, five, the first digit's the thumb. Uh, so Baryonyx has this really heavy, uh, highly pronounced claw on the thumb. Uh, it's known from the weld clay of England, and this was only discovered in 1986. Uh, again, if you look at the skull here, very long, very low, not quite so high. Uh, and again, you see these conical teeth. In this case, they're uh, mildly serrated. Uh, it looks very much like a crocodile uh, jaw. It looks like a, a modern gharial, uh, very elongated, very narrow, very skinny. Uh, we also start to see on the back here on the spine, these neural spines uh, forming kind of this really low hump or ridge along the back. Again, that's one of the characteristics of spinosaurs is they have this ridge along the spine. You see they're kind of just little tiny paddles here along the spine. So uh, in baryonyx, the spine is not as pronounced. Uh, they're probably related to Sucomimus, uh, or may even be the same actual species, uh, just a different name. So uh, suco is like crocodile and mimus is mimic. So crocodile mimic, uh, we'll see these kind of names used over and over again. So just like rau is suki and rau is crocodile, suco is crocodile, mimus is mime or mimic. So crocodile mimic. Um, so this is baryonyx. Again, this, this claw just like, uh, and again, it's on the thumbs here. So they have these uh, free arms. Uh, for, for hunting and grasping. Uh, another famous example of uh, Spinosauridae is Irritator. So this is a kind of weird uh, name for a dinosaur. Uh, so it's named after a, it's a Brazilian Cretaceous. Uh, so it's from the early Cretaceous. So it's, it's a, again, a pretty basal Spinosaurid. Uh, the reason it's called Irritator is the skull that it was defined from was kind of heavily damaged by collectors. So it was illegally poached out of a quarry that they had no permission to go into. And then they sold it to collectors. 
and the collectors kind of manipulated it. They altered it. Uh, you see there's a large crack down the middle here. They actually filled that crack with Bondo, uh, car bonding agent, but kind of like a body fill. So they were trying to make the skull look better than it actually was. Uh, they did some alterations to some of the teeth, uh, and then they even actually pasted on some parts to kind of artificially elongate the skull to make it kind of more attractive. Uh, and then they illegally sold it to a museum. And so all of these different things that they did to it, uh, when scientists actually sat down to kind of look at the skull and analyze the skull, it irritated them how altered it had been and how much data had been lost, how much information had been lost uh, in this alteration and like attempts at really counterfeiting. Uh, so that's where the name comes from. They're irritated at all the irritated <laughs> stuff that happened. Um, originally, it was thought to actually be a pterosaur because it kind of has, again, this elongated skull and they actually did artificially elongate it even further. So they had this idea that it was a pterosaur skull and they wanted it to look like a pterosaur skull. Uh, and also because of the conical teeth, so, you know, spinosaurids weren't really recognized yet. Um, or at least this wasn't recognized as a spinosaurid, so it was they were trying to make it look like a pterosaur skull. Uh, if you look at the back here, uh, Baryonyx had a sale that was uh, kind of, or the Irritator had a, a sale that was uh, larger than Baryonyx's, uh, but it wasn't quite as much as some of the later kind of more derived spinosaurids. And so uh, what kind of lifestyle was this thing living? Well, it has the very similar elongated skull here, again, very much like a gharial, modern gharial. So probably piscivorous, but uh, at least one specimen, there was a tooth found embedded in a pterosaur uh, in the neck vertebrae of a pterosaur. So at least in this case, they, it was feeding on a pterosaur. So it was active, it was uh, either actively hunting pterosaurs, like it's sniping them out of the air, uh, or it just happened upon a dead one and it was scavenging it. Uh, there's always a big problem with paleontology with these teeth marks and embedded teeth. Uh, it's pretty easy, well, I shouldn't say easy, but uh, we can often relate teeth marks to a particular type of dinosaur. And if the tooth is still embedded in the bone, it's even easier to kind of link back up to dinosaurs. So uh, it's, it's often we can figure out what made the teeth marks, uh, what was eating or at least biting uh, that other specimen. Uh, but it's very difficult to determine whether that was like an active hunting and what killed that dinosaur or if it was a later scavenging. So it's very difficult to tell like the difference between actively hunting and consuming versus just happening to happen upon its corpse and, and eating and scavenging it. Uh, if there are like uh, an embedded tooth that shows signs of being like healed, uh, that's pretty good evidence that it was actively hunting because it means it bit it while it was alive and that it lived through the attack. But if it's bone that never healed, uh, it's very hard to say whether it was an active hunt where that animal killed the other animal or a subsequent later scavenging. Um, now onto uh, Spinosaurus itself. So again, Spinosaurus means spine lizard, the very elongated neural vertebrae uh, that support that this massive uh, back sail here. Uh, so uh, Spinosaurus aegypticus, again, it, it may be the largest theropod dinosaur uh, ever. Uh, which would make it the largest carnivore to have ever walked the earth. Uh, whatever the largest carnivorous dinosaur was, whether it be Spinosaurus or Gigantosaurus or Tyrannosaurus or Carcharodontosaurus, which we'll talk about, I think, next time, uh, whichever one of these was the largest carnivorous dinosaur was the largest carnivore ever. Uh, and it may, in fact, be Spinosaurus aegypticus. So Spinosaurus aegypticus may be the largest carnivorous animal ever on the face of the earth. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, but like all Spinosaurids, uh, Spinosaurus is the, what the group's named after. It has, you see this very long, very low, not very high, uh, narrow skull like modern crocodiles, modern gharials. Uh, in this case, Spinosaurus, the teeth are non-serrated. So unlike the earlier versions there, it's a non-serrated conical teeth. 
Uh, so Spinosaurus really kind of got on like the pop culture radar uh, in Jurassic Park 3 when the Spinosaurus actually fought with the T-Rex and the Spinosaurus won in Jurassic Park 3 and I think the next time they fought the T-Rex won but uh, again this is a question that often fascinates people like uh, if these dinosaurs fought like who would win but remember that uh, these are both very large carnivorous predator animals, uh, if they were to encounter each other, they probably wouldn't fight. Uh, there's a couple scenarios where they might, one might be like fighting over food resources, protecting territory, uh, things like that, but generally they're not going to fight each other. These are very, very dangerous animals and they have to be smart about it. If you're a predator and you become hurt and wounded, uh, nature is very mean. <laughs> uh, you, if you are wounded in the process of the hunt or in the process of fighting a rival, uh, you're very likely to not make it or at least be wounded enough that you're severely hampered. And so predators are very careful about selecting prey that they can take down a little bit easier. Uh, and they're not going to actively look to fight other very dangerous carnivorous animals only in like extreme circumstances. So uh, that fight probably wouldn't take place even if they did share the same environment. However, remember last time we talked about that as through the Mesozoic, the continents are moving apart. Uh, Spinosaurus and Tyrannosaurus were not even on the same continent. So Tyrannosaurus was in North America, particularly the Western part of North America. And Spinosaurus, uh, Aegypticus at least, was in Africa. Uh, there's no evidence of any Spinosaurids in North America, although I think there's like scattered fragments that are tentatively assigned there, but there's no strong evidence of Spinosaurids in North America. It's kind of weird because they're global everywhere else, uh, but there's no evidence that they existed on the North American continent. Uh, also, so not all dinosaurs existed together in all the same space. They also didn't exist in the same time. So Spinosaurus is from the late Cretaceous of Africa some like 95-ish million years ago. Uh, Tyrannosaurus is from the very late Cretaceous of North America, like 68, 67, 66 million years ago. They made it all the way to the end with the meteor impact, Spinosaurus didn't. So uh, they're separated in time and space by 30 million years and on totally different continents. So this fight uh, in Jurassic Park would never actually happen. Uh, even if they did uh, occupy the same time and space, they probably wouldn't fight each other, but it never happened. The, this has to be an artificially uh, generated fight. Uh, in the Jurassic Park movies, since they ended up one and one, it was presented as a fairly even match. Uh, so was that actually the case? So let's take a look at uh, Spinosaurus. So uh, Spinosaurus has changed uh, pretty radically its interpretation over time. And so, uh, we talked a little bit about with Megalosaurus, initially the kind of quadrupedal lizard-like interpretation kind of dominating initially, and then the shift to the bipedal, uh, very upright, probably too upright stance. Uh, in the case of Spinosaurus, though, the pendulum's kind of swung back the other way, uh, where it might, it's been recently, fairly recently interpreted as uh, quadrupedal. Uh, so particularly, the uh, Spinosaurus aegypticus specimen uh, has uh, pretty short hind limbs compared to the forelimbs. And so when you have kind of equal size hind limbs and forelimbs, that usually kind of points towards uh, quadrupedalism where you're using all four limbs to walk. Uh, so it probably wasn't an obligate biped where it was sort of forced to walk up, right? Where that was a uh, common stance. Uh, it was maybe semi-bipedal where it was mostly walking on the hind legs, but maybe using the forelimbs uh, for support sometimes. Uh, the, the more modern interpretation is that it didn't walk much at all and that it was actually mostly swimming. Uh, and in that case, the discrepancy, uh, the similar size between the forelimbs and the hind limbs uh, doesn't matter as much for weight bearing because the water was supporting it. So in this model here, with the bipedal the or quadrupedal, the center of mass is kind of between the fore and back limbs. If you're going to be a bipedal 
upright animal, you need the center of mass above the hips. And you see in this construction here, uh, this dinosaur looks very top heavy, uh, the weights forward of the hips, which means that walking bipedally on two legs uh, would be very tricky. Uh, so uh, which one of these is right? Well, uh, I guess we don't really know, uh, but uh, the short leg model here, the kind of more quadrupedal model uh, is being used to reconstruct uh, Spinosaurus aegypticus. And it's kind of been transferred through to all other Spinosaurids, whether we have evidence of that from the fossils or not. So is this true of all Spinosaurids? Uh, maybe not, but that's kind of the way the reconstructions are going. Uh, another thing that's very uncertain about Spinosaurus is the sail itself. So over time, kind of the dimensions of the sail, uh, how big the sail was, uh, whether it was kind of like two lobes or one lobe, uh, how lobe was it? Uh, was it fleshy? Was there fat? Uh, the different interpretations of the sail have changed pretty radically over time, depending on what you interpret the function as. So if we think back to functional morphology lecture, uh, form follows function. Uh, here's the form. Uh, what's the function of this thing? So one is that it's a big old radiator. So this would be covered in skin and very highly blood vessels. Uh, and it would be using to dissipate heat. So this is a very large animal, uh, perhaps the largest carnivore ever. Uh, and so was the sail there to dissipate heat? Uh, if it was aquatic, uh, is this a rudder for kind of steering through the water, kind of stabilizing in the water? Uh, again, one of the kind of cop-outs, if there is a structure that looks kind of goofy, and we don't have a morphology or a functional explanation, uh, the default is to kind of go to sexual display. Like if we can't figure it out, uh, we'll be like, why does it have this elaborate head crest? Or why does it have these elaborate feathers? Why does it have this elaborate coloration? Uh, why does it have this big elaborate sail? It might be for sexual display. Um, that would be in increased evidence if like the males had it and the females didn't or vice versa. Uh, or was it uh, a fat storage thing? So like. Uh, was it like a camel's hump? So uh, sometimes what's reconstructed as a fleshy sail is actually reconstructed as kind of this big broad hump on the back where it would store fat and water reserves like modern camels do. Uh, what you see though with a skeleton of a modern camel is that you know while the vertebrae on the back are a little bit elongated, uh, they don't fill the whole hump. Uh, and so it's not really like what we'd expect to see. But it's another piece of evidence here, though, if you were trying to reconstruct a camel just from the bones, just from the hard parts, uh, would you draw a hump on a camel? Uh, probably not, uh, especially a, a brachian camel. Like, would you draw two humps on the animal? Uh, there's not really any evidence kind of pointing that direction. So it just kind of shows us the limitations of trying to reconstruct these organisms from just the hard parts. And Spinosaurus is an excellent example. This sail has dramatically changed. Uh, you see here again, the, the very pronounced sail here from the fossils. Uh, so it's a, it's a large feature. There's a person, it's, it's about a person tall. Uh, you see here, they've actually reconstructed this. Uh, they didn't choose bipedal, they didn't choose quadrupedal. This is reconstructed in a swimming position. And so again, this is the kind of evolution over time bipedal with kind of a relatively low sail, uh, very broad sail, bipedal, uh, kind of a more modern interpretation. This is kind of with the hump. And now this is kind of the pendulum swinging back the other way to, well, it has these pretty scrawny hind limbs compared to the forelimbs. Uh, maybe it does walk quadrupedally on fours. Uh, so the other big debate is, is it aquatic? So when more uh, caudal tail vertebrae were found, uh, it was seen that the tail kind of had this like paddle shape to it. So we had the big sail, the big fin sail, but the tail was you know, usually reconstructed, uh, as you see here, kind of like a, a normal, more traditional regular dinosaur tail. Um, but at least in this specimen, uh, the tail had elongated extensions too. And so the tail of Spinosaurus 
uh, was kind of like a, a big flipper, basically a big tail flipper. Uh, it was a big paddle. So was Spinosaurus an aquatic predator where it was swimming around? And uh, if it was, uh, were the toes actually webbed? So this is a reconstruction here of Spinosaurus actually being an active uh, underwater pursuit predator where it's swimming after fish and eating fish. So we know it ate fish. So uh, based on the dent dent dentition, based on the teeth, based on the jaw structure, based on the chemical evidence, it ate fish. It ate a significant amount of fish, not only fish, but it ate a lot of fish. Uh, so it definitely ate fish. Was it underwater swimming with the fish and actively chasing fish down? Uh, or was it more like a heron where it was kind of like stalking along the coastline and kind of dipping in to grab fish? Uh, how adapted to water was it? Uh, did it have flipper feet? So again, if we think about like a marine iguana, uh, marine iguanas have a tail that's fairly similar to this. Uh, it does, they don't have flipper feet. Uh, they're very at home in the water, but if you looked at just their hard parts, you wouldn't really know it. So is that kind of Spinosaurus or was Spinosaurus just kind of hanging out by the water's edge? Uh, this debate has kind of gone back and forth. Uh, there was a very recent paper that sort of undid most of this stuff and said that uh, it probably wasn't aquatic. Uh, so let's talk about that in a second. So again, with all these different uncertainties in how it stood, uh, whether it stood at all, maybe it was swimming most of the time, uh, what the sail was for, how the sail was shaped, and whether it had like fins or flippers, whether the fin, the, the sail actually helped it swim, uh, it's changed pretty radically. Uh, as recently as this year, uh, there was a paper that kind of swung the pendulum back the other way, that it was all kind of like becoming at least somewhat well accepted and well regarded that that Spinosaurus was an aquatic dinosaur, which again would be sort of interesting because it would make it the only uh, primarily aquatic dinosaur. Uh, when we think about like ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, pliosaurs, mosasaurs, those are highly aquatic animals, uh, fully aquatic animals. Dinosaur, those aren't dinosaurs though. Uh, as far as we know, all dinosaurs were terrestrial and they all walked on land to some degree. Uh, maybe they occasionally waded into the water uh, but they weren't swimming around chasing stuff down. Uh, Spinosaurus is the possible exception to this, which is why it makes it kind of so neat. And it makes that aquatic interpretation very attractive. It makes it a, a unique kind of different kind of dinosaur. But a recent paper this year, the beginning of this year, uh, proposed that um, just like crocodiles, so it has a lot of features that crocodiles have, uh, but the tail is actually a little bit less muscular than a crocodile's tail. Uh, crocodiles are not great swimmers themselves. They're, they're good at swimming, but they're not as good as fish. So like this idea that Spinosaurus would be an active underwater pursuit predator capable of like chasing down and engulfing fish in the water, uh, it probably wasn't capable of doing that. The tail was probably a little stiffer than what we see here. Uh, and it wasn't as muscled as a crocodile's tail. So it, they, if anything, they were probably worse swimmers than crocodiles. And even crocodiles are not good enough swimmers to actively chase down fish. They kind of wait and they ambush fish as they come along. And that's probably kind of more what Spinosaurus did, whether it was like under the water or in the water or on the water. Uh, that's probably, it was probably an ambush style predator uh, more than actively kind of swimming. So it probably didn't have the webbed feet, but maybe, again, this is this paper refuted an earlier paper. And so it's still very much open for debate. And what's what's going to require is, again, eventually objective truth sort of wins out. Uh, once we get more fossils and the weight of evidence starts pointing very strongly one way or the other, uh, it'll start kind of locking in. But at this point, the jury is still out. There is evidence that kind of points in both directions. And at this point, I would say that both are kind of equally likely. Uh, I kind of favor the kind of heron model just because it makes a very similar to all the other dinosaurs where it wasn't aquatic, but uh, there are attractions to the other model. It's, it's kind of neat to think of a fully aquatic dinosaur. It makes Spinosaurus unique and, and, and a little bit cooler maybe. 
but definitely what's changed though is that again Spinosaurus in the early 2000s Jurassic Park 3 kind of era uh, it is potentially the largest theropod maybe being aquatic is one, re one reason that it got so large uh, it had kind of a much smaller sail that was kind of a lot more robust. Uh, this is pretty delicate, uh, relatively easy to break. Uh, again, if you're a dinosaur uh, actively predating, you don't want to be injured. Being injured is bad. It makes it what that makes life difficult. Uh, walking on two really highly muscular legs, uh, and it killed the T-Rex in Jurassic Park three with no difficulties. So this was kind of the early two thousands model. Uh, what we see, though, is that the jaw is very elongate, very narrow. Uh, if it bit something as robust as a T-Rex, uh, it would probably snap its jaw. The jaw is not evolved to take on very large prey. It's designed for piscivory and capturing smaller animals. Uh, a, a gharial, with its very thin, slender nose, it's not taking on incredibly large prey. It's not designed to do that. It, it probably couldn't fight a Tyrannosaurus Rex or something like that. It's not built for that. It's built for hunting fish and it's very good at it. Uh, so Spinosaurus now, uh, kind of this humble weird fisherman, uh, life depends on very fragile sail. So again, uh, boring giant swan, uh, like a heron, uh, can't kill anything that's not a small fish. Uh, probably not quite as boring as this, but uh, it's definitely not like this giant super predator theropod. It, it might be the largest theropod, it might be largest carnivore, but it's not actively hunting like large herbivorous dinosaurs. It's not fighting large carnivorous dinosaurs. Uh, it is uh, as to some degree uh, hunting fish along the water's edge or in the water, but uh, it's not kind of what we originally thought it was. Uh, if that makes it less cool in your eyes, then sorry, but uh, it's just not what it did. <laughs> Uh, so we'll figure out more about what it did later on as we get more fossils, but that's kind of where the story is now. Uh, and that's all that I've got for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.